Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this episode of Defense News Weekly, we discuss aircraft retirements and munition supplies headed to Ukraine with the House Armed Services Committee's Chair on Tactical Air and Land Forces Panel. Plus, the State Department approved a major international sale. See who will be firing off the HIMARS. And also, a potential VA program to clear medical pot for vets for pain treatment. That and Capitol Hill's reaction to the DOD's latest plan to provide abortion access. And later, we take you inside a Cold War nuclear bunker hidden for decades in northern Denmark. It's those stories and more in the latest in news and analysis from the Pentagon to the platoon here on Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly, I'm Colin Demarest. Rob Whitman represents the Hampton Roads area of Virginia in Congress and is the chair of the House Armed Services Committee's Tactical Air and Land Forces Panel. Defense News reporter Stephen Losey sat down with the congressman to bring you this report. I want to start out by talking about uh, air issues. Mm -hmm. The Air Force has long been trying to retire older parts of its fleet to free up resources to allow it to modernize elsewhere. For many years, it often ran into opposition from Congress, particularly when it came to the A-10 Warthog. In the uh, NDAA approved last year, there was a breakthrough in allowing A-10 retirements. Do you feel the mood has shifted on Congress when it comes to aircraft retirements? I think Congress looks at it from the an aspect of making sure that we are transitioning from, from legacy platforms to newer platforms. I think the issue all along has been making sure there's not a gap there. This whole idea to divest, to invest, has to make sure that the, that the curves on retiring aircraft intersect the curve of arriving aircraft and new production coming into the fleet. As you look at uh, proposals made by the administration you know, retiring 600 plus aircraft, but then only bringing in 240 plus aircraft, I think creates some concern. So what I think Congress looks at is sustainability. That is, are we going to have enough aircraft to meet this nation's needs? And that means not only capability, but capacity. And capacity is the total number of aircraft. We understand as platforms age, they are, less capable, but we want to make sure we have enough of them because we know that quantity does have a quality all its own. So I think Congress is very, is very aware of where the balance is, and that is we don't want to keep around legacy platforms that don't have the utility, but we also understand too that we have to be able to keep construction on pace for newer aircraft to where you don't have these big gaps. We're uh, probably about a little bit more than a month away from the uh, administration and the Pentagon releasing their budget proposal um, for the coming year. What are you hoping to see from that um, budget proposal as far as um, capability levels and um, the Air Force maintaining the right aircraft balance? Well, I want to make sure that we're on sustainable path, especially on production for F-35, because we know sustainability costs are tied to the total number of aircraft that we produce. If you fall below that, we know what happens to the life cycle cost of the aircraft. They go up, so we want to make sure we're staying on that path. So I want to see the signal from the White House that we're staying on track with total number of F-35 aircraft being produced. I also want to see, too, that we're staying on track for sustainability with F-15EX. As you know, we were at 144. The number the Air Force is talking about now has come down somewhat from that, just a little over 100. So I want to understand where is the White House in sustainability on F-15EX because that does have a role uh, in the future air combat scenarios. So I, I want to be able to see those elements of what happens across all the different platforms, the F F-35A, B, and C. Also want to see too what we're doing in sustaining 
engine modernization. We know the challenges that are going on there. It's going to be uh, quite a spirited competition, which is good. That, that competition is going to be good. We want to make sure that as members here on the Tactical Air and Land Subcommittee that we do our due diligence to understand both both companies and what they bring to the table in, in engine modernization capability. So we want to see the proper commitment of resources there. So engine modernization takes place for F-35, that we stay on pace in producing F-35. We stay on pace with producing uh, F-15EX. And another element too is we want to make sure too we have sustainability in carrier air wings. And that means looking at the full complement of aircraft. You know, we still continue to build a few F-18s to make sure we are able to replace those that are aging out of the fleet that don't make sense to do big deep dive service life extension uh, on those aircraft. So those are the things too we would like to see in this President's budget. Deliveries of new F-35s have been on hold for almost two months now mm -hmm. since that very alarming F-35B mishap yes. in Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. um, Engine deliveries, uh, deliveries of new engines, I should say, were also put on hold mm -hmm. towards the end of December. Is this, uh, is you, are you and your subcommittee, are you concerned about this? And what are you doing to um, exercise oversight of this? Listen, we're always concerned when there are challenges with an aircraft, especially when it comes to safety. So, yes, we are concerned. What we want to do is to discover what is the Air, Air Force and... Uh, and Lockheed doing to address the problem. It really is an engine vibration issue there. I think that the engineering staffs, both the Air Force and Lockheed, have come up with a solution. They're putting that in place. Again, just met yesterday with the, the F-35 Joint Program Office uh, director uh, getting uh, a lay down about where they are, what's happening with production. The good news is production continues to take place. They are, though, getting right to the point of, of having to make sure that they have the solution uh, place uh, set uh, because if they don't it can then affect production. Uh, what's happening right now is aircraft continue to be produced they're just not being delivered because the Air, Air Force is waiting to say okay what solution sets do we need to put in place to make sure that we fix the problem as it is identified. So I, I'm confident in where the Air Force is and where Lockheed is in, in determining a solution for this putting the solution in place to make sure we can stay on pace with the manufacture and delivery of these aircraft. I think the Air, Air Force is doing the right thing by stopping delivery of the aircraft to the Air Force, but the good news is uh, it's not affecting production at this point. I, I think with the plans that the Air Force has and with what Lockheed has is it won't affect production. Uh, if it goes past the projected date of solution, then it could, but at this point it is not. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Milley, um, is uh, coming up on the end of his tenure later this year. Mm -hmm. There's been a few names that have been suggested the White House is considering for um, his successor. One of the front runners is Air Force Chief of Staff, General C.Q. Brown. Mm -hmm. um, if he were to nominate, if President Biden were to nominate General Brown, would he find support on the Hill um, for that choice and from your committee? And what, what's your take on General Brown? Sure, listen, I had breakfast with him uh, earlier this week. I think he is uh, doing an incredible job there, a very challenging set of circumstances. Uh, I think he has the wherewithal to, to, uh, to perform any job within the Pentagon. And of course, it won't be in the hands of the House in making the confirmation of whoever is going to be nominated as the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Uh, but I've, I've been very impressed by General Brown and the things that he's done as Chief of the Air Force and looking forward and, and really being a, one of those visionary and inspirational leaders. He and I uh, shared the, the stage together at the Reagan National Defense Forum talking about thinking uh, creatively and innovatively about how do we, how do we cross-pollinate the expertise that's in the private sector, especially in areas like cyber and artificial intelligence, in quantum computing, those, those elements that we're going to need in the Air Force, and how do we cross-pollinate? How do we encourage folks that work in industry to, to maybe become reservists in the Air Force? How do we make sure, too, that folks that are in the Air Force Reserve, how do we encourage them to maybe seek these positions in the private sector so that we have this, this broader cadre of folks with these skill sets that are going to be necessary for the future. So, you know, he has those sorts of ideas that I think are really what you need in a leader and how they think and how they look at the challenges we face today 
and look at creative solutions. You know, all the service branches are dealing with recruitment and retention issues. So if we can look for other ways to broaden the, the, the space where they can recruit in and then retain to make sure you're meeting people's needs professionally and personally, I think those are, are very creative ways to solve these problems. And, and my conversations with General Brown have been right along those lines, and he's been very much in the forefront to do those things. So I think that's an indication about who he is, how he thinks, and that's really the attributes of a leader, uh, of somebody that's looking at solutions, being creative and thoughtful about how to do that, and then looking overall about what's best for the country, what makes the Air Force the most effective air fighting force in the world. The B-21 Raider stealth bomber had its very public debut yes. um, last December. What's your uh, subcommittee's plans for exercising oversight of this important program as it approaches its first flight and potentially a low rate sure. production co contract? And what do you want to see out of it to make sure this important acquisition is on the right track? Well, on on. The subcommittee that I chair now, the Tactical Air and Land, that's out of our portfolio. It's in the Sea Power and Projection Forces portfolio. I'll still be a member of that subcommittee, and I have been very much involved with that program from the very onset in going out to, to Palmdale, meeting with Northrop Grumman and the Air Force. I think it's been incredibly successful, and, and I was skeptical to begin with because there were a number of challenges there, but to the Air Force and Northrop Grumman's credit, they have done an incredible job and, and keeping on track to produce what will be the most advanced aircraft ever built by man. Uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's on track and we're going to continue to track it very closely and I will have a role as a member of the Sea Power and Projection Forces Subcommittee to look at B-21, but if it stays on track as it has, and I have every reason to believe that it will, I think it will be an incredibly successful program and it is one of the cornerstones in our nuclear triad. So we have to get this right and it has to stay on budget and on schedule. And so far through a whole variety of complexities, it has done just that. Congressman, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for speaking with us. Thank you, thanks for the opportunity. And when we return, weed and abortions are two controversial topics making their way into veteran and military life. See the reception on Capitol Hill. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. Two controversial topics may affect military members and veterans. The first is a potential VA program to clear medical marijuana for patients battling pain. Secondly, we hear about the Capitol Hill reaction to the DOD's latest plan to, to provide abortion access. We check in with Military Times Capitol Hill Bureau Chief Leo Shane to hear the latest. Using medical marijuana as a remedy for PTSD and other health issues among veterans has gained more acceptance in recent years, but there's been one major roadblock to its use, the federal government. Could 2023 be the year that begins to change? That's the question after a key Senate panel approved new legislation regarding cannabis and veterans' treatments. Under the measure advanced by the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee, federal officials would be required to hold clinical trials on the use of medical marijuana for both chronic pain and post-traumatic stress disorder. It would also call for a study into how the use of the drug can affect veterans' quality of life, for better or for worse. Right now, doctors working at the Department of Veterans Affairs cannot prescribe medical marijuana to patients, even in states where it is legal to use. They can talk broadly about the potential benefits or problems with cannabis use, but they offer no direct practical advice on whether it can provide relief to veterans suffering from issues like long-term depression or poor pain management. Veterans advocates believe the new study could be the first big step in changing that. Already, the National Academy of Sciences has found significant evidence that cannabis is helpful in treating anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorders, but federal research has been limited because marijuana is still classified as a dangerous substance by the Food and Drug Administration. The new study proposal has been floated in Congress before. House lawmakers have passed similar proposals in recent years, but this is the first time a major Senate panel has approved the idea, and passage came with broad support from both Republicans and Democrats. An identical bill is working its way through the House now, also with bipartisan support. Veterans groups say they're optimistic that the measure can make it to a full vote in both chambers soon and potentially become law by the end of the year. That work could still be sidelined by other priorities and controversies, however. One of those potential roadblocks is a developing fight between Hill Republicans and administration officials over the issue of abortion. Secretary Austin signed a memo directing the Undersecretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness 
to oversee implementation of a number of initiatives designed to ensure reproductive health care access for our service members and their family members, and to bring clarity to DOD policies in the wake of the Supreme Court decision in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization. Recently, House Armed Services Chairman Mike Rogers threatened to block some Defense Department authorities in response to new rules from the department allowing service members to be reimbursed for travel across state lines to receive abortion services. Defense officials said the move is needed in response to last summer's decision by the Supreme Court to overturn the long-standing Roe v. Wade decision, which legalized abortion nationwide. Since then, dozens of states have put limits on the procedure or outlawed it entirely. Military advocates have said the ruling hits military members particularly hard because they have limited choices where they are assigned and when they can travel. The new policy is meant to ease some of that difficulty. But Republican lawmakers have said the new policy is a way of getting around those state bans on abortion, using taxpayer money for a procedure that many individuals find morally offensive. Alabama Republican Tommy Tuberville has threatened to block all Defense Department nominees until the policy is reversed. Rogers said he's looking at the upcoming defense authorization bill debate for ways to rescind or limit the new Defense Department policy. Hearings on the issue are expected in coming months. Whether that fight overshadows other priorities for troops and veterans on Capitol Hill remains to be seen. For Military Times, I'm Leo Shane. And now for Defense Dollars. Lockheed Martin will deliver hypersonic missiles to the Navy and Army that can be integrated with the Navy's Zumwalt-class destroyers under a $1.2 billion deal awarded Friday. Lockheed Martin is the integrator for the hypersonic weapon program, which the Navy calls conventional prompt strike and the Army calls long-range hypersonic weapon. The two services leverage a common round but put them in different launchers. The U.S. State Department has approved a possible foreign military sale to the Netherlands for high-mobility artillery rocket systems. That's according to a statement from the Defense Security Cooperation Agency, which approves this type of sale. The Netherlands would purchase 20 Lockheed Martin-made M142 HIMARS launchers and 17 Humvees. The package also included support and communications equipment, as well as munitions. The potential sale is worth $670 million, but that amount could change while negotiations are underway. DSCA said in an announcement that the sale would support the United States security objectives by helping a NATO ally. In July 2022, the State Department approved a possible foreign military sale to the Netherlands for $1.2 billion involving Raytheon Technologies made Patriot missiles. When we return, we get the latest money tips from our personal finance expert on avoiding tax scams. Welcome back. On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack shows you how to avoid tax scams. No matter what we do, scammers always find new ways to try and steal your identity and your money, especially during tax season. The IRS once reported fraudsters stole over $30 billion in tax return funds from millions of stolen identities. So be extra vigilant this time of year. If you get a call or email saying you owe money to the IRS asking for personal or account info, hang up or delete it immediately. Phishing and vishing are also used to get at your personal info. The target gets an unsolicited email or calls posing as a legitimate company. To avoid falling victim to this tactic, simply ignore it. Don't respond or click on links in emails, texts, or online. If you think you've been phished, report it to phishing at irs.gov. And if you think someone stole your identity or used your social security number for employment, financial transactions, or to file a tax return, visit the irs.gov's Taxpayer Guide to Identity Theft for help immediately. Despite the rise in tax scams, knowing what to do and what to avoid keeps you ahead of the game. So stay alert and stay informed. And for more info on tax scams, visit irs.gov. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next time. To get more coverage of military and defense topics, find your LT and point them to Army, Navy, Air Force, and MarineCorpsTimes.com, as well as DefenseNews.com. And to have the best scuttlebutt, sign up for our early bird brief for stories delivered to your inbox each weekday. It's also in audio. Check out the podcast version out now. And if social media is where you get your headlines, follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. When we come back, go inside a Cold War nuclear bunker hidden for decades in northern Denmark. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. 
Regen Vest is the name of a Cold War bunker made for Denmark's government leaders and royalty to escape to in case of nuclear war. Today, we go inside that bunker and see why it's still relevant. After the event of the Hungarian uprising and the Suez uh, incidents, the fear of a war in with the center in, in Europe was very real. Uh, and at the same time, also the, uh, the nuclear bombs, and especially the hydrogen bombs, has evolved. And they were so devastating that you had to do something else than what you have done before. You have to think in another way. And one of the things that were a key issue was to keep governmental control into your country and to make places that could, as well as possible, protect the government against an atomic blast. The idea was, at least in the beginning of the Cold War and when this was constructed, that a war um, would fall in three phases. And the first phase was considered the most serious, and it was supposed to be about 30 days. And actually, most people thought that the war would be settled within these 30 days. If you could manage to hold the country for this first period, then you probably had a chance to remain in, in control and to win the war. So this is built to house the government during these crucial 30, 30 days. This area is what you would call the map room, and I would say that it was the heart of the building, so to say. It was um, where the government was supposed to be gathered and to take all the serious decisions. You can see about everything here. And it, it is just as if they sort of left rooms when the Cold War stopped and then abandoned the place and went out. So you can see yeah, paper clips, paper, furniture, um, Well, food is not preserved here, <laughs> but, but, but all the plates and the cups and uh, it, well, everything, um, carpets, uh, pillows, you name it. You could say that this is uh, the last bastion of the democracy, because it would be here you'd uh, evacuate the Danish government, and it was from here they should try to... Um, save the Danish population and the Danish democracy. And if they had to abandon Regenvist, then actually there was no government on Danish soil and the Danish democracy would have disappeared. Just the fact that you have a war on European soil and also that the, um, the threat of a nuclear war is actually something you speak about, makes this very real world, suddenly, um, and, and, and makes a sort of the Cold War feel a little more close by than it was. I mean, we have more or less forgotten about the threat and the nuclear weapons, and uh, even though we knew they were there, we didn't speak about them for many years, but, but now it's, it's, it's coming up again. That's all we have time for this week. Please visit us on militarytimes.com and defensenews.com for more coverage. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.